what's the Talmud Bavli? Talmud Bavli, that's the Gemara, that's the oral law, the Babylonian Talmud. That's the Gemara that was eventually written down, which was an oral Torah, and it was eventually written down because the Jewish people were going to exile and they'd forgotten a lot of it. So it's a commentary with all of the mitzvot explained and put into print. That's basically what it is, in short. It's a lot more than that. Um, written 2,000 years ago. And the Gemara, the Talmud, is an explanation of the Mishnah that was written down before it, which was a uh, concise and a little bit cryptic uh, explanation of the mitzvah. Okay, that's really what it was. Yeah. So we describe the Gemara, all the Jewish laws are written and explained inside the Gemara, inside the Talmud. Okay? Okay, so we'll be doing a bit, we're going to do a lot of Gemara because Judaism basically is Torah and Torah is written and it's explained in the Gemara. Right. Okay. Um, we're going to look at two words today. Two very, very important words. And we kind of mentioned them last class. But these words are really the same word with different vowels and that changes everything. Okay, it's a Lamed, that's an Endachaf, and it's a Lamed, Endachaf, and this spells Lech, Lecha, Lech, Lecha, two very, very important words, my friends, Lech, Lecha, anyone know what those words mean? Lech means to go, to travel. What's lecha? And who are these words told to? And why are they so important? Has anyone heard this expression, lech lecha? Remember, confuse only over the blank pages, please. And the bias take notes. Lecha is like talking to you. To you is correct. That means it has to be talking. Here we're not talking, actually. Here we are walking, interestingly enough. Yeah? For you, this is for you, right? Yeah. Who are these words told to? Abraham. Abraham. By who? God. By God. Very good. Where was Abraham? Where was Abraham and his wife Sarah when these words were said? This is God talking to Abraham. Where was Abraham? When these words were said, yeah? Uh, right, he was outside of Israel, or Ur Kasemach, probably at this point in Haran, okay? He'd already left Ur Kasdim, and he was on his way somewhere. Where was he on his way to? Anybody? Where was he going? Hmm? To? To Canaan, right. What's Canaan? Israel. Well, it wasn't Israel yet. It was Canaan. Canaan is a reference to the geographical location that one day would be called Israel. Okay. So this is the command God gave Abraham much later in life. He was in his 70s at this point when he was told to do this. Now, we're going to see that Abraham was given 10 tests. And they're all, pretty much all, listed in the Torah. Okay? Not as a checklist, boom, boom, boom. Just episodes that he went through. There were 10 episodes that he went through. There are different opinions what these 10 tests were. There were different opinions what these 10 tests were, but everyone agrees that this was one of them. Some say this was the first one, God bless you. Some say the first one actually was him being thrown into the fire in Ur Kastim and surviving that miraculously. Some say that, but that test was not written in the Torah. But everyone agrees, most people say this was the first of 10 
test of Abraham. Now this number 10, we're gonna speak about a lot. This number 10 is gonna appear a number of times in Jewish history and Jewish thought. Can anyone think of other times we see the number 10? This should be a list you make because it's gonna be relevant. Some famous number 10s, yeah. Um, how do you say? Mother? I don't know. <laughs> commandments, that's very good. We're gonna discuss 10 commandments. There's 10 commandments, very good, yeah. A minyan is 10 people. Very good. It takes 10 to make a minyan. Actually, that's based upon a community. Also, right? It's the minimum amount of community. One second, we got to. 10 plagues. There were 10 plagues, 10 makot. That's correct. Any other 10s? Any other times you see 10? Yeah, Ronnie. I have a question. Not yet. We're going to get to it this day. Hold on, hold on. We're going to get there in a second. Let's just figure out why there are 10, what this number represents. Then we're going to double click on this number one. And we're going to go into it in a lot more detail. Yeah. We did that. Ten commandments we have. Yeah. Aserat Dibrot. Yeah. If you like, don't include the company, then like the Levine, then there's like ten. Uh, no, there's twelve tribes. Okay, twelve tribes. Like yeah. Yeah. Well, the Levine and the Kohanim actually come from the same tribe, from oh, Levi. Okay. Yeah. So there's twelve. That's twelve. Very good. There are ten days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the Aseret, Yemei Teshuvah. Okay. Including the first two days of Rosh Hashanah. Very good. What of all these 10, there's actually many more, but just the ones you've spoken about, what do you think the number 10, if it appears in different places, you can assume that those events, although they seem unrelated, are connected by the number 10. So what does the number 10 represent? And 10 tests of Abraham, it says in Pirik Avot, in the Mishnah. What does number 10 represent? So the rabbis tell us, specifically the Maharal of Prague, he says something fascinating. He says the number 10 always represents a complete change, a new beginning. Okay, 10 commandments. We didn't have them. And then we did. It's a whole new being. The Torah was given to us as 10 commandments. 10 days. Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. 10 days of Teshuvah repentance. You're a new person, Rosh Hashanah. And you become a completely new person by Yom Kippur. 10 Makot. Those 10 plagues we're going to see changed world history. Right? That was the first time open miracles happened on a large scale, which led to the Splitting of the sea, Kriyat Yam Suf, and then Har Sinai. Yeah? So 10 is a new, something new has been created. A certain Teshuvah, we are the new people who are created. Torah given, we are the new nations. Always something new. So Abraham was given 10. As soon as you see 10, you're like, oh, something new is about to be created. Right? That's the number. Think about it. There is no number 10. It's just one and a zero. There's a number one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine. And then 10 is going back to the beginning and adding a new element in the 10 denomination. You hear? Makes sense, yeah? So this is the beginning of the 10 tests. The beginning of the 10. This is what gets Avram started. Now there's a few things we have to think about. Number one, this test of Abraham. Well, first of all, why is it a test? Why is it even a test? He's told to leave and go. Why is that such a difficult thing? Why is that such a difficult thing? I want you to look at the words of the Pasuk. It's one Pasuk on page four. It's in Bereshit, Yud Bet Aleph, Genesis 12, 1. Can you see the second paragraph on page four? Okay, I'm gonna read it. Now the words over here are very, very specific. So let's do it together. Vayomer Hashem El Avram. Is that his name, by the way? Is his name Avram? What's his name? Abraham. Where's the hay? What? It's missing. Yeah, right. It's, missing, right? it's not there. It's missing. Very good, dude. Yes. It is missing. That's right. Where is it? He didn't have it yet. 
He didn't have it yet. He's going to get it, but it ain't there yet. He's going to be given later on. By the way, do you know why he gets given it later on? It represents his mission. We're going to talk about names. I don't think we're going to do it today. Maybe we will. Maybe later on. But your name, we're going to see, represents your mission in life. And his mission changed from Avram to Abraham. That hey changed everything. By the way, his wife, what was her name? Sarai. Sarai. And it was changed to Sarah. So she was given a hey as well. What number is hey? What number is hey? Hey. Hamsa. Five. So she gets a five. And he gets a five, which comes to... Oh, boom. Drop the mic. That's right. So now, there's a mission. They were both giving you a gematria. That's right, numerical value. Aleph is one. Bet is two. Give us the different forms of gematria. This is the most simple one, but it, it hints at things to us. It reveals certain things to us. It's like a spice that spices things up. So it's five inside. By the way, where did her yud go? She lost the yud. She was Sarai. So Hashem took away the yud. And it went somewhere. Did anyone know where it went? Be very, this is a very difficult question. Oh, fantastic. Yoshua. It was Hoshea bin Nun. And he's not even born yet. He's going to be the one to lead the Jewish people into Israel many, many, many years later. Not a coincidence because Abraham's about to go into Israel. And he was given the letter Yud to help him. Okay? Because the Yud and the Hey are the first two letters of Hashem's name. Okay? So now Sarah and Abraham later on are going to be given this name. So Abraham, Abraham now, before he has Yitzchak, is going to be Abraham. Is Abraham going to become Abraham? Okay, fine. So Vayom Hashem El Avram, Lech Lecha, Lech Lecha, go, Me'artzacha, from your land, Umimeuladetacha, and from the place of your birth, Umi Beit Avicha, and from your father's house, follow inside El Haaretz to the land Asher Areka that I'm going to show you. There's so much in that Hasuk, that verse, you have no idea. First of all, what's weird about this verse? Look at the English. There's something not right over here. Something, I'll give you a clue, backwards. There's something back. You have to think a little bit. Sorry to make you think this early in the morning. There's something <coughs> backwards about this pasuk. What is backwards? I'll do it again. God says to Avram, Go from your homeland, from your birthplace, and from your father's house to the land that I'm going to show you. What's backwards over here, friends? Very good. It's back to front, isn't it? Let's have a look. When you want to leave somewhere, okay? You came from Israel, right? Leo, they came from Israel? Okay. First of all, you left your home. Then you left your town. And then you left Israel to come to New York. This is backwards. First of all, it says you have to leave your homeland, then your birthplace, and then your home. Can you see it's backwards? Everyone get that? Ronnie, you got that? When you leave, first you leave your house, then you leave your town, and then you leave your country. Here, it's, it says first we leave your country, then it says leave your birthplace, and then it says leave your home. The verse is back to front. That's the question the rabbis have. Specifically, the Ramban. Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, not the Rambam. Rambam is Maimonides. You say Rambam and Ramban with an Rosh N. Rosh ben Nachman. No, 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 no. That's somebody else. No, no, no. no. no That's Breslau. Is that Mishra Mish- 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 No, En Kesha. No, no, En Kesha. We're talking hundreds of years between them. Now, this is Rav Moshe ben Nachman, the Ramban. And he says, obviously, this is not a statement of geographical movement. The Torah doesn't tell you the time someone's moving. He went to say he went from point A to point B. Then, therefore, why are we being told that he is leaving 
Obviously, there is a message. Can anyone think? It's not an easy question. What the Torah is telling us by reversing the order of his movement. What is the Torah telling us? So the Ramban says it's actually increasing levels of difficulty. Abraham is leaving behind everything that he knew his entire life. It's hard to leave your country because in the end your country influences who you are. It's harder to leave your community, the town where you grew up, your town, your city, your that's your community. They're the ones who make you who you are. It's hardest at all to leave your home where you grew up every single day. In his case, he grew up surrounded by a Bodhisattva, by idol worship, and that was the hardest of all. To leave and travel. Now, leaving and traveling was difficult as it is. Like, really difficult. It was dangerous and tiring. And you lost money, maybe your health. There were people who wanted to attack you and steal from you. But that's not what this is talking about. This is saying that just leaving behind to create a new nation, which he's about to do in the land of Israel, was extremely difficult. That's one of the elements of the test, and it's hinted at in the Pasuk. Are we clear? Ronnie, you had a question before. Does your question still stand? We're good, sister, yeah? Fantastic. Hi. Come in, come in. Welcome. Come take a seat. Right there. Are we together? Now, we said last class, that's one of the reasons we're on page four, halfway down. That's one of the reasons that Abraham was traveling. He's a moving person. And there have been two great journeys in Jewish history. Two great journeys in Jewish history. One is Abraham leaving Orkastim and Haran to go to Israel. And Israel those days wasn't like it is now. You couldn't just walk in, get a fluffle and hang out, you know, and get a shawarma or a shawafel, which is shawarma and fluffle, which is like, you know, an artery builder right there. That'll kill you, and, you know, in a laffa. You don't need that stuff anymore. Well, at your age, you can. At my age, you have to give that stuff up, right? It was very difficult. That was against, no one was leaving those towns. No one was going to Israel. It was extremely, actually, as soon as Abraham gets there, there's a famine, he's going to have to leave which makes it even harder. I should just go there. He gets there and he's like, I can't even stay, there's no food. Imagine that. Imagine God saying to you, oh, you must go to this place. Most amazing place ever. And you get there, you're like, I can't even stay here. It makes the test even harder. It doesn't even make sense. This is crazy. That's part of the test, by the way. When you think you're going somewhere, and this is what I need to do, and this is what I have to do, and you get there and it's like, this is even harder than I thought it would be. What am I doing over here? Imagine that. People don't understand. That's part of the test. Because, and this is the key, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. So people are all thinking, oh, it's about the destination, where I have to get. No, it's about the journey. You've got to get there. And once I'm there, yeah, don't worry about that. Will I ever get there? Maybe yes, maybe no. It's all about the journey itself. What was the other great journey that Abraham's descendants were going to make? Yep. No, I was going to say, yeah, like, in the desert. Okay. Uh, so Moshe Rabbeinu and the Jewish people were told to leave Egypt and go to Israel. Similar, right? The two reflect each other. Both of them are insane. No one left Egypt. Egypt was the America of the day. It's like leaving, you know, America to go to Kabul, Lavdal. Right? You know what I'm saying? It's like, who's doing that? We're trying to get out. We're not trying to get in. Lavdal, right? You know what I'm saying? To make a, make a difference. But the point is still taken. No one was doing that. You're crazy. And yet the Jewish people, now most, we're going to see that most Jewish people did not, well, they weren't Jewish at that point, but most of the Hebrews did not leave Egypt. They didn't want to go. And Abraham went by himself with no students. We spoke about that last class, if you remember, right? No one's like, I'm not going, you're crazy. 
To it? No one's going to Canaan. There's a famine over there. I ain't going there. So two journeys away from the epicenter of life. You okay? You spelled? Yeah. Always happens. Two great journeys. Leaving. Avram leaving his hometown. And the Jewish people learning from that. Leaving Egypt to go to Israel. The expression I want to give you. I don't know if I mentioned it already. But I'm going to mention it now. Masa avot siman labanim. We did wrote that down last class. Yeah. The actions of our forefathers is a sign to their descendants. That's what we're doing over here. That is where we are going. We're leaving one place. And by the way, this journey was completely illogical. It made no sense. And yet we do it. Okay. Why two words? How do you say go in Hebrew? How do you say go? Lech. Lech. Lech is to go. Abraham is being told to do two things. Lech, lecha. Why is he being given two words? What does this word mean? Lech, lecha. Lech, lecha. This says go. You're, you're outside of Israel. Go to Israel. It's going to be the future homeland of the Jewish people. This way you're going to become a great nation. You and the land and your descendants through Yitzchak and through Yaakov is going to be the land of Israel. The land of Israel is going to be Kadosh. And we're going to talk about Israel a lot more, what it represents. This is the way you're going to go. But why two words? Why don't you just go? Why lech lecha? What is this word telling me? This is enough. Why lech lecha? What does lecha mean? Go for yourself. So there's two explanations and you can have your own. One is go for yourself. What do you mean for yourself? This is for your benefit. That's what the commentators tell us. The rabbi has said, this is for your benefit. You may think this is going to be like a terrible test. It's going to break you down. No. Tests in Hebrew, a nisayon, a test. A nisayon is there to challenge and take you to a better place. Life is full of nisyanot, tests. By the way, it's interesting, the word nisayon has a word inside it, which is what? Ness. What's a ness? It's two, uh, two translations. One is a miracle, because if you get through it, it's a miracle. Every challenge we pass is a miracle. But there's another word that is a ness. A ness is also a What's a ness? A banner, a flag. A banner and a flag. Why would that be? Why would a miracle have the same translation as a flag? And that's because when you win over a test, it's as though you put a flag in the ground, it becomes conquered territory. I own this space. I own this. Yeah? That's why the word ness. So that's so the word test has inside it ness. It's a miracle to get through it. And once you do, boom, you put a flag in, conquer territory. Remember this course, every Hebrew word I put on the board, you need to write down and know the translation to. You're going to have to know these words. Okay, so do please write down every single Hebrew word. Every class, we're going to have at least five, maybe ten Hebrew words. Okay. How do you pronounce test? Nisayon. Ni Nisayon. And what's Ness? Nisayon. Ness is a miracle, it's a nest, it's just a root. And it happens to be a flag as well. Right? Okay. So that's hinted at inside the word. But the word Nisan is a, is a test. Okay. Ah, so why Lech Lecha? So what's this word doing? So one is for yourself. You're going to benefit from this journey. It's a Nisayon. And it's been a miracle to get through it. But you're going to conquer, you're going to win this, and you're going to move forward in life. What else can it mean? What's lacha also mean? You said it before, someone said it before. Lacha means to you. To you. What does that mean? 
Left Lachaim. Go to you. How can he go to you? I'm here. Where am I going? I mean, go to you. What, what does that mean, go to you? You're going to, you say in Hebrew, Rasa Panimi, very nicely put. In English, we say you're going to find yourself. You know the expression? You're going to find yourself. Let me find myself. I'm here. I'm right here when you find myself. I know where I am. Oh, you think you know where you are, but you're going to find yourself. This journey, this test, actually every test that everyone goes, every challenge, is an opportunity to find yourself. So very early on in the Torah, before the Torah is even given, we see that life is challenges. And each challenge, well, let me ask you. So Abraham's got 10 tests. So we're going to talk about the first and the tenth. Those are the main ones. There's others in between. But the first and the tenth. Which do you think is more difficult? Number one or number ten? One. Which is more difficult? Why do you say number one? Because it's new. Like he doesn't know that. That's good. You could say that. Or you could say ten. Ten. number ten. Why number ten? Because it could progressively be getting harder. Why would it progressively get harder? Because you have to move past it, right? It's like, this is Judaism 101, our class, yeah? That's easier than my Hilchot Shabbat class that comes after this, right? And my Mashiach class after that, right? Things get pretty simple. It's like a high jump. They put the bar down here. They get over. Right? One person falls. Disqualified. They put the bar higher. Why do they do that? Make it lower. No, we're trying to get... You've got to see the potential in the people higher. And then they're like, you've got to try to work hard to get over. Right? Because at this stage, you... You did one, and now you did two. But now you did one, two, and three. Now you only get to level three if you pass two and one. You can't jump to number 10. So Hashem starts with smaller tests and makes it harder. We're going to see with the makot, with the plagues. The first one was bad. Second was worse. Third, and by the 10th, it was the worst of all. It's got to be progressively harder. If it's not harder, there's not a test. If I give you, you know, your second grade test right now, it would be stupidly easy. I would never do that. It's got to be progressively harder. So test number 10 is going to be extremely difficult. We're going to see there were tests of famines, there was tests of wars, but number 10 is going to be the hardest test of Abraham. So let's discuss number 10. All right, makes sense. Number one, number 10. We're looking at bookends over here, Nahan. We're looking at... Um... We're going to see every test or just 10? No, no. Number one and number 10. Oh. Other ones are important, but number one and number ten are going to reveal a lot to us. That's, that's the beginning, the opening, the, you know, like the hundred meters, the off the block, and then the finish line. The other tests are important, obviously, or they were to Abraham. But number ten is going to reveal a lot to us. What was the tenth test of Abraham Avinu? Hmm? Akedat Yitzchak. Akedat Yitzchak. So this is number one. And two explanations we're going to see based upon that. The tenth test is going to be extremely difficult. So we're going to jump forward in history now. We're going to jump forward in history. And we know that Abraham and Sarah could not have kids. Which itself, some say, was a very difficult challenge. But now let's get the tenth test. Number ten. This is going to be the completion. It's going to be the new, right? With the ten, you reach ten, you reach the new thing. Everything else is built up to this point. So everything that Abraham has done his entire life is leading up to this one point. That means everything you need to know about all previous tests at every point of his life comes down to this one test. This is number one. Number ten. You see, it's ten times this. Right? It's one with a zero. This is when you become a ten. And number ten is, pretty much everyone agrees, is what's called Akedat Yitzchak. Which literally means, anybody know? Akedat Yitzchak. Doesn't mean sacrifice. We call it the sacrifice. We do call it that. I'll tell you why. But that's not literal than akedet. What does akedat Yitzchak mean? It li- just we get the literal uh, translation. Binding. The binding. That's right. 
to bind down, what you call the binding, to tie down of Isaac. Who was Isaac? His son. His son. Okay, now let's think about this. There's a lot of challenges we need to figure out this particular challenge of Avram Avinu. Okay? Now remember, at this point in history, there is no Torah, there are no Jewish people, it's Abraham. Yeah? He's had to figure out there's a God. He's pushing monotheism. And he's fighting Avoda Zara. Avoda Zara. What's Avoda Zara? Avoda Zara is what? Is idol worship. So Abraham is spending his entire life telling people, don't kill yourselves for God. Specifically, don't kill your children for God. Oh, now that's très intéressant. Anyone speak French? Of course you do. Right, the Moroccans all speak French, right? French Morocco. That's all the French I have, by the way. Five years I started in England, nothing at all. Terrible. I should have listened more. It's very, very interesting. Abraham spends his entire life telling people that there's only one God. God wants us to live. God is good. And telling people, don't worship idols. Especially, don't kill your kids for God. Somebody? Tell me something. Hello? What? And now God's telling him. Like pulling teeth. And now God's telling him to kill his son. You get that? So we got a lot going on over here. Number one, this makes no sense. Because God told Abraham, and Abraham figured out, don't kill your family, your children. Don't suicide bomb them, they're still doing. Don't be proud of the kids go do that nonsense. That's all God. It's easy to die for God. You know what's tough? Living for God. That's tough. Everyone could just blow themselves up and kill innocent men, women, and children. But that's not what God wants. We're still having a trouble spreading this message. God wants us to live for God. So that's number one. <coughs> number one, it makes no sense. Because my entire life, I've told people not to do that. But there's something even worse. And that is, God told Abraham, you're going to have a son through your wife Sarah, who was very, very old. So that was a miracle in and of itself. And now, this son, who God told Abraham is going to become the next member, the only one who's going to create the Jewish people, has to go. One second. God tells Abraham, have a son Yitzchak, because from him, your descendants are going to come. He's not married yet. He's got no kids, Yitzchak. And God says, right, kill him. You see the problem with that? God's breaking his own promise. Are you understanding this? We have many, many problems with this. Let's, let's write these down. Let's write these down. So we're done with Lechlecha. He's done. He's passed the Lechlecha. He's passed all the other tests. Now God says, I've got a crazy test for you. Number one, kill your son. Kill Yitzchak. Kill Yitzchak. Okay, what's the problem with that? Well, Abraham told everyone, don't kill your kids to other Sorry, small g. Gods. Yeah? Don't kill your kids out of the gods. That's number one. Number two, Abraham was told he was going to to build a nation through Yitzchak. Through Yitzchak. It's even stranger. 
because he didn't get a chance to do it. He has a So God's breaking his own promise. Right? Does that make sense? There's something even more difficult than all of this. Which people don't realize is part, there's many parts to this test, but there's another part which is extremely difficult for Avram himself. Besides the fact that he loved Yitzhak, and God told him, and then it goes against his philosophy, it goes against his belief, it goes against logic, because God was the one who told him he was going to have a kid, miraculously, in his old age of nearly 100 years old. He was going to become the father of all future Jewish generations. And he's being told to me, there's something even worse than this. You know what's even harder for him? Imagine you're Abraham Avinu. For a second, you're walking around, and God says you're going to have a child, his name's Yitzchak, you're very happy, and he's going to have kids, and they're going to have kids, and they're going to become the Jewish people, and one day they're going to receive the Torah and all the mitzvot. You may become the Am Hanivcha, the chosen nation. Fantastic. Now you're walking around town. Don't kill your kids for God. Don't do it. That's not what God wants. Now God says, go, go kill him. So you're walking with your son, and he accepts this test. And he's walking with Yitzchak, schlepping around. He has Yishmael with him as well as other son through Hagan. And he's walking to this mountain where he's told to do it. We'll talk about that mountain in a few minutes. The mountain is very, very, very important. The place is important. He didn't tell him to go to a cellar, uh, go to the attic and shoot him in the head. He told him to go to a mountain. That's interesting. Okay, and that mountain is going to be very, very important. The location is very important. We'll get to that in a second. Remind me. Imagine someone comes up to him and says, Abraham, where are you going? He says, where are you off to? You got your two sons with you. He was very famous, remember this, very rich, and it changed thousands and thousands of people's lives. And he said, oh, I'm just going for a walk. Where to? That mountain over there. Oh, really? What's on that mountain? Uh, nothing right now. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen over there? I'm going to take my son Yitzchak up to that mountain. What are you going to do with him on a mountain? I'm going to kill him. I'm sorry, what? I've been told to bring him as a sacrifice and bind him down and kill him. And God's like, and this person who's with them is like, I'm sorry. Did you just say you going to kill your kid? Yep. Why would you do that? God told me. You've been telling us for decades not to kill your children. Haven't you? What is Abraham going to have to say? He has no choice. What's he going to have to say? Which is the hardest thing. He's going to have to admit, I was wrong. This isn't just killing him because God told him one thing and something else. And then he loved his son and he's being taken away. He's going to have determination. But he's going to have to admit, I was wrong my entire life. Imagine that. Imagine you're entirely convinced of something and someone says, actually you're wrong. Was he wrong? No. That's why Yitzchak wasn't killed. He wasn't wrong. So why is God making him do this? It's a test. But there's two things happening over here. One second. It's a test for him and a lesson for us. A test for him and a lesson for us. His test, boom, boom, boom. Our lesson, we're being not only told, we are being shown not to kill your children. So now we're having what's called show and tell. This we don't do. And that's why this event had to happen on a mountain. What do mountains represent in Torah, in Jewish thought? What does a mountain, a har, always represent? A mountain is a har. What does a mountain represent in Jewish thought? Places of instruction, of learning. They're high. People can see them. Desert 
represents places of challenge and difficulty and physical and spiritual death. But a mountain, a har, always represents learning and instruction. What mountain was this mountain is going to become probably definitely the most famous Jewish mountain in world history, the most holy mountain. And there's a lot going to happen on this mountain again and again and again. What's that? Har ha Moria. Mount Moriah. What is the word Moria? Any Moria say that? One of my class have a Moria actually. Yeah. Moria. What does that word mean, Moria? Hora. What does that mean to? Lalamet to teach. The mountain of teaching. That's the name of the mountain. Like a Moria. Yeah, it's related. Yeah. Har ha Moria. There's a girl in another class called Moria. Moriah. Moria. 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 A place of teaching, of instruction, of learning. You're going to learn something. This mountain is going to appear again and again and again. And by the way, even to the future, Mashiach, God willing, who that is we're going to discuss, is going to have a big role in here. What does this mountain become? <laughs> no, the Kotel is next to the mountain. Abet Hamikdash. The first and second temple are going to be found on this mountain. Yaakov, Abraham's grandson, Yaakov, Jacob, is going to have a dream on this mountain of a ladder from earth to heaven. Remember this? And the angels are going up and down. The Malachim going up and down. What did you say desert were? Place of difficulty and challenge. If there's no food, there's no, nothing can grow in a desert. That's where the Jewish people, when they left Egypt, are going to be thrown into a desert. We'll see that later on. That's not a coincidence. Yeah? Can I so ask we you see, yeah, one second. So we see that this is a place of learning, and Yaakov called it something. He called this mountain Shar. Shar ha shamayim, the gateway. Shar is a gate or an entrance to heaven. Shar shamayim. So Yaakov gets there. It's still just a plain mountain, but and it becomes Shar. He refers to it as Shar, the gateway to heaven. So what's the mountain where this happened, Moria? Same or? mountain. Oh, it's the sa oh, different no, names. Name. No, Yaakov yeah. refers to it as Shara Shemayim because he sees the angels going from earth to heaven. It's the entry point. And we're going to see that all tefillot, prayers, actually go through Shara Shemayim. And the Beit HaMik, the temple is going to be there. King David is the one who made Jerusalem famous. And he put the foundations in. And he, Solomon, his son, Shlomo HaMelech, is going to build the first temple on that space and that's going to be destroyed by, by, by the Babylonians and then the second temple is going to be built over there after the whole Purim story and then that was destroyed by the Romans we'll see later on we do it we're going to do a run through of history and then one day in the future the third and final temple is going to be built by Mashiach who he is we'll discuss at a later time just jumping to the end of the story, and that's going to be on that third and final space. So that is a very holy spot. The Kotel is the wall that was built surrounding the mountain. Yeah? Um, do you mind repeating again? Uh, why Everything I said? No. I'm oh, just, good. <laughs> just the part of why Yaakov called the mountain. Ah, because Yaakov slept on that mountain because he had to... Oh, he had to leave Israel and go and live with his uncle Lavan to escape his twin brother Esau. Yaakov, Jacob, had to flee because his brother wanted to kill him. And on the way, he stopped at this mountain because he knew this is where his grandfather brought his father as a potential sacrifice. So he wanted to go pray in that place. There's an idea of praying in certain places where incredible things happen. So he goes. 
And while he's there, he falls asleep and he has a prophetic dream, a chalon. And in that dream, he sees a ladder, Jacob's ladder. From Earth. And on the ladder, he sees angels going up and down. It's the access point, the, this world and the spiritual realm connect at that point in Jerusalem and Harabai. That is a connection. Hence the expression, Shar Hashemayim. So he sees that as the access point, which is true. He was able to sense it. We now know it. That's why all prayers, wherever they're made throughout the world, travel to Israel and go up. Someone told me recently, I just read this actually, that if you write a letter, Dear God, and you mail it, of which there are thousands sent every year, they get sent to Jerusalem to the Kotel. Did you know that? I mean, way around the entire world, they sent to Israel. Look it up. Thousands! Considering this holy today. Very holy today. Good the Shekhinah, listen, the temple was destroyed, but the Makom itself is still holy. The western wall, there's many walls, there's a southern wall, an eastern wall, northern, but the western wall is because it's close to where the Aaron, the ark that had the Ten Commandments and the Torah, to where that was. So it's still very, very holy, and you're not allowed to climb up there. I served um, on Halabai, and there was very unholy stuff going on there. Yeah, there is. It's terrible. So, how could it still be considered? Terrible, terrible. Terrible. But how could it still be considered such a holy place? Because people have desecrated it, and it was desecrated. Right? That's our mountain, and they put up that Al Quds and put up a mosque as well. Absolutely yeah, right. But it's not even just that. I'm saying, like, Jewish blood is still there. Like, it's not like yeah. It's a... Still keeps its holiness. That will not change the wholeness of a place. People being killed up there doesn't change that. The Kedusha has always been there. More so by the Western Wall, Hashem Shechina never left there. But it's still there. That's why you're not allowed to walk up. You're allowed to walk around, but you should not walk. Well, some people say, Safaradim, specifically Poskim, say you shouldn't even walk up there at all. Now, if it's there to save a life, like soldiers will be allowed, but even they shouldn't go in the middle. Because you have to have a certain amount of purity to walk up there to this day. Which is what? You have to go to a mikvah. And two, you need something we don't have nowadays, which is the para aduma, the red cow that they used to kill, burn, and sprinkle that would purify people. Purify people to go up there. We don't have that nowadays. So those who do allow people to go up there, don't allow in the middle where the temple was, because the entire area was in the temple, they see you have to walk around. So I have a very good friend of mine who's the head of police over there, and he tells me, he goes up there and they people walk around. You can't walk around them. You're not allowed to walk into the main part. No Jews allowed to walk up there because there is still an inherent holiness that is there. So when you see those people going up there, first of all, they've purified themselves, they're meant to have, and they're walking around the edge. But just because other people have invaded it, and desecrated it doesn't mean the wholeness has removed it. It's like someone comes in to a synagogue, heaven forbid, and vandalizes it, it's still a synagogue. It doesn't lose its inherent kedusha holiness. Yeah? I've given you a lot of it there, but I just wanted to. Yeah, Ronnie? What about the Shulgan on that? I think she's, I think she's referring to there's been, well, right now, the Wakaf. To this day, right, but that's not a coincidence, by the way. These are actually Jordanians, they they're actually Jordanians. They were given control, which was by the stupidest thing ever. One of the biggest mistakes in Jewish history, if you want to ask me, was Moshe Dayan giving the keys to the Waqaf after we, in 67, took over control. But we'll leave that aside. That's my own personal gripe. It's actually so insane in Masamina Shemayim, right? It's so insane. Maybe it's good, had the Jews had full control and stayed up there, it would have become like another tourist spot, you know what I'm saying? So we stay at the Kotel. We stay, which is not on the mountain. It's next. It's the plaza next to the mountain. The temple was on top of that mountain. The temple was on top. Okay. Even Jewish people try to do like unholy things on that mountain. I hear. Don't judge Judaism by the Jews. <laughs> That's the mistake we have to try to avoid. Don't always judge Judaism by what Jews are doing. Not always a great representation of what we're meant to be doing. Yeah. I have a question that's going to be earlier. Yeah. If God 
cattle around that he's like they're gonna be a nation from his son. Yeah. And then he told her he told him like to, to sacrifice his son. Yeah. But like doesn't he knew like from Wahabush or something that at the end he wasn't gonna join us? Abraham? No. Abraham was fully but intending to kill him. I know. That's so, part of the test. Says it doesn't make sense even. He had to break his own logic. He had logic about Hashem. was like, even your own logic is being tested. That's the whole point. That's, it's going against everything he believed or knew. That's what made it so difficult. Let alone the fact he's got to kill his son. We'll leave that aside. By the way, as a side, I must say something very interesting right now. You know, we talk about stress, you know, and challenges in life. What does it say specifically about Avram Vidu waking up in the morning? Vayashkem Avram Baboker. Avram woke up to do this test early. Says, what? Every time someone does something in the Torah, we're told what time he wakes up. We're told he woke up early to do this test. Why do I care if he woke up early? So he slept in. What does that mean he woke up early? So when I was a kid in Yeshiva, the rabbi would always say, oh, when you have a mitzvah to do, do it straight away. Zrizut. You should be, have alacrity, you should jump to do a mitzvah. And that's how I always grew up thinking that's what it was teaching us, which is probably true. Even something you don't want to do, a mitzvah you don't want to do, you've got to wake up, you've got to get the job done. It's unpleasant. You've got to help a friend, you've got to go pray, you've got to do this, you've got to go to synagogue, you've bothered, you've got to speak your mind, whatever it is, you don't want to do it, do it anyway. He woke up to do it. You know what, else? What? What? That's probably just the nervousness. You know what tells us? Even more than that to prove the opposite of what you're saying. If he woke up, it means he went to sleep. Imagine that. Imagine being told you've got this terrible, terrible challenge, right? And like, I'll be up all night. Please, Hashem, think about it. I mean, we know Avram Avinu can argue with God. He prayed to God tons not to destroy Saddam and Amara, right? And yet, he's able to say, I'm going to bed. This is what Hashem wants. I'm Makabal, I accept. And he went to bed. So the fact that says he woke up means he went to bed. Wow. Imagine that. Woof. I mean, people have a little stressed, they're up all night, can't sleep. And Avram's like, this is my job. In other words, we're actually being taught about Emuna, having faith in God during challenge. Bam. Look at that. Whole different way of looking at the story, right? Son, it's all about Emuna, that, God, that Avram accepted this challenge. And but that doesn't mean he was a pushover. Avram argued with God. Moshe Rabbeinu was told he was not allowed to go to Israel. He's like, hey, no problem. Is that what Moshe Rabbeinu did? He made a mistake. A big mistake. What that mistake was is another story, not for now. So Moshe Rabbeinu, Hashem says, no Israel for you. I was like, okay. He prayed to God. How many times? A lot. A lot is very good, yes, a lot. 500 Fifteen times the gematria of Ve'et Hanan, I plead it. There's a parsha in the Torah called Ve'et Hanan. That comes to 515. Imagine that. And he would have done 516, but God said, stop, you're not getting in. It's not for you. He made a mistake. Yeshua is going to take them in. That's where the Torah finishes. Outside of Israel, the death of Moshe. The next book is Yoshua, which is the story of the Jewish people entering into Israel. And God said, pray 515, but you can't pray one more time. I would have had to listen to you. So I'm not going to let you pray that one extra time. So we know you can argue with God. You can know you can, but you should. When you pray, you should boom, boom, boom. Keep knocking away. If it's not going to happen, it won't. So it's a lesson in Emunah as well. Big stuff. Big, big stuff. It was worth it coming in this morning just for that. I have a question. Yeah. I don't mean to be like stubborn about it, but are we saying that we should ignore logic and sense? Some, very, very good. That's not me. That's a great question. Should we ignore logic and sense? It's a, that's a lot to discuss over there. A million things. Like, I would say. If, if you came right now and said, I'm going to go kill my son, 
I would probably call the police. Yes, you should. Even if you told me that you God should. was telling me. There were no, absolutely. By the way, if I'm saying you God spoke to me last night, we know we're in trouble because prophecy has disappeared. <laughs> there is no prophecy. So if anyone says to you, which I'm not even joking now, I am told every day by a lot of people that God spoke to them. I'm not, kid- I'm not even kidding. You. I'm not even kidding. Jewish people? Some Jewish, many non Jewish people. I have that videos on Mashiach and prophecy online, and I get comments all the time. First of all, many of them believe they're actually the Messiah. And they write to because I have a book on Mashiach. <laughs> many of them. It's called the Messianic Complex. It's a real condition. By the way, Jerusalem is full of such people who think they're the Mashiach. They go to Israel, they go to Jerusalem, they stop taking the medications, and the hospitals are full. I'm being absolutely serious. It's part of a larger group. You can look it up. Messianic complex is part of something called delusions of grandeur. There's many, many people who think they're the Mashiach, and they think they're God, and God spoke to them. I get messages out. People call me. I'm not even kidding you. I have, by the way, that, just look, I mean, I don't recommend it. Just read through some of the comments I get on my YouTube videos. You're like, wow, so many people think they're Mashiach. Because I have a course, I teach a Mashiach, here and elsewhere. So I have hundreds of classes online. I have my book on this topic I wrote four years ago. And people write, I'm the Mashiach. I'm like, how do you know? God told me. You know, is that that joke? Oh, because they're going to make it better. Oh, there's tons of people who do that. How do you even respond to something? Usually I don't. Usually it's a excise in futility to explain to them that I'm a Mashiach. By the way, I know the Mashiach's job. You don't want that job. It's like you don't want to be president of America. It's a terrible job. Terrible. Who wants to be president? Oh, terrible. Who wants to have that job? Everyone's like, oh, best job ever. No. Worst thing ever. It's going to kill you. Better make your money try to help the world elsewhere. Not a job for a good Jewish boy or girl. That's what I say. Mm-mm. So logic is a very important part, but there's something else called emunah and bitachon. So logic doesn't just formulate and of itself. It's part of past something else. We have dat is knowledge, which is important. And then there's emunah and bitachon. We're going to talk, those three go together hand in hand. They overlap like a Venn diagram, like overlapping circles. We're going to come to it another time. We're going to have to stop over there. Good job, everyone. Great class. Yeah.